Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman. I'm a producer and editor here in the Free Library's Author Events Office, and I'm excited to be here to introduce today's author, Congressman Adam Schiff. The United States Representative for California's 28th Congressional District and the Chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Honorable Adam Schiff was the lead manager for the first impeachment proceedings uh, against former President Donald Trump. He is a former member of the House Appropriations Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee and served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles from 1987 to 1993 and a California state senator from 1996 to 2000. Some of his current legislative priorities include ending the COVID-19 pandemic, I highly endorse that, thank you, uh, fighting for economic help for American families and small businesses, making healthcare universal, confronting climate change, and addressing systemic inequality and racism. Mr. Schiff joins us today with Midnight in Washington, how we almost lost our democracy and still could. In it, he offers a re revealing look at one of American democracy's most challenging moments, his own path to becoming one of the former president's most prominent critics, and the principles we need in the struggle against autocracy. The Washington Post has this to say of it in a recent review. Midnight in Washington is more than just Schiff's damning recitation of Trumpian offenses against American institutions. It is overwhelmingly a rebuke of Republican lawmakers and administration officials for letting it all happen, for failing to stand up to Trump. Today's author will be in conversation with Tracy Matisak, an award-winning journalist and broadcaster, a terrific interlocutor, and a great friend of the Free Library and us here in the Author Events Program. So let's get right to it. Congressman, Tracy, thank you both so much for being with us today. And the screen is all yours. Well, thank you so much, Jason, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're delighted that you could join us and uh, do remember what Jason said about uh, that Q&A icon. You can put your questions there and we'll budget as much time as we can for your questions at the end of our conversation. That said, Representative Adam Schiff, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, thank you, it's great to be with you. So before we get into the book and some of the big issues of the day, we all uh, awoke this morning to the news that General Colin Powell had passed away due to complications from COVID. And I wonder if you would take just a moment to share your thoughts with us about his contribution to the country. Well, it was really sad news to uh, wake up this morning uh, to the realization that uh, this great patriot had passed away. Uh, I think he was uh, a man of, of incredible courage and tenacity and in, an inspiration to a great many. Um, I got to meet him a few times. I, I can't say that I knew him personally, but uh, having heard him speak and having watched uh, his career, uh, he was uh, a trailblazer in so many ways. Uh, I think that uh, Colin Powell uh, viewed the Iraq chapter as, uh, as uh, a you know, a mistake uh, in terms of his legacy, a serious mistake. Um, but, uh, but he also served the country so well and so ably for a great many years. And, uh, and I think America has lost one of its great patriots. Well, onto the book, Midnight in Washington. Early in the book, uh, you write that, and I'm quoting you now, you say, there is now a dangerous vein of autocratic thought running through one of America's two great parties, and it poses an existential threat to the country. In this, we are not alone. All around the world, there is a new competition between autocracy and democracy. And Congressman, I ask you, how much danger are we in here in the United States um, of losing that competition and democracy along with it? I think we're at great risk right now, and uh, it comes as a terrible realization. Uh, I think probably five years ago, we viewed ourselves unquestionably as the strongest democracy in the world. Uh, we were, I think, uh, certainly not a, a perfect democracy, but we uh, shone a light uh, to many uh, countries, to people in repressive regimes. Uh, journalists uh, from their prison cells in Turkey looked to us. Uh, political prisoners in Evan Prison in Iran looked to us. Those who were the victims of extrajudicial killings uh, in the Philippines look to us. But increasingly over the last several years, uh, people around the world don't recognize what they see. And they've come to question uh, democracy. They've come to uh, question American leadership. Uh, and here at home, uh, of course, uh, we've had uh, four years uh, under the last administration uh, that was characterized by tearing down a lot of our democratic uh, guardrails. 
Uh, so it's been, I think, a really difficult year, uh, years, uh, 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 several years, uh, for democracy at home and around the world. Uh, and we are clearly not out of the woods. You also write that in 2018, in the aftermath of the House Intelligence Committee investigation into Russian interference, you said that you realized that the greatest threat to our democracy came not from Russia or any external source, but from within. And you're right that, and I'm quoting here, one by one, Donald Trump had been tearing down our institutions. And the question is, can our constitution with its checks and balances uh, among the three branches of government survive a president who seemed very comfortable um, ignoring those checks and balances and so far has been able to get away with it? Well, it did survive its first test over those four years. I'm not sure that it would survive another test like that. Uh, and you're absolutely right, Tracy. Uh, one of the terrible realizations I came to, frankly, early on in the Trump administration um, was that the threat that I had been focused on, the threat coming from Russia, Russia's meddling in our elections, the, the challenge posed by China uh, with its uh, autocratic, it's really its totalitarian model. Um, those threats were no longer the paramount threats. The principal threat to our democracy was coming now from a president uh, who believed that the press was the enemy of the people, who began using the Justice Department to protect himself uh, when he was engaged in corrupt conduct, uh, to reward his enemies by uh, um, reducing their sentences or making cases go away completely, uh, and using that department to go after his enemies. Uh, and one by one, I saw these, these uh, guardrails come down. Um, and the other you know, realization, uh, frankly, that I, I came out of that first impeachment trial with was that there wasn't any flaw in our constitution. There wasn't any flaw in the impeachment remedy. I don't think we should, for example, reduce the threshold for impeachment to a majority vote. Uh, that would turn us more into a parliamentary system. The problem was that there weren't sufficient people in the Congress willing to give those provisions the content the founders intended. Uh, if they're not going to apply right and wrong, if they're not willing to acknowledge the truth, then none of the rest of that works. Uh, and this has been the paramount challenge. Uh, in four short years, I saw so many of my colleagues in Congress capitulate to the immorality of the executive. And that was really the story I wanted to tell. There are a lot of uh, books been written about uh, what, go, what, what went on in the Trump White House, but there's very little that's been demonstrating uh, very little written about what went on in the Capitol uh, and how so many people came to abandon their ideology, uh, abandon their morality and embrace this, this would be autocrat. Speaking of the Capitol, I wanna talk about the select committee on January 6th of which you are a member. And of course, tomorrow uh, you will begin the process of making a referral for contempt of Congress uh, charges against Steve Bannon for defying the subpoena to testify. And, and I'm wondering, but isn't it true that uh, a criminal case against Bannon or any other witnesses who would defy a subpoena can take years to play out? In the meantime, the clock is ticking toward the 2022 uh, midterm elections, which could change everything depending on how they go. And I guess the bottom line question is, um, ultimately, can you really force Steve Bannon or any other defiant witness to testify? I, I think the answer is yes. And we're moving with uh, great alacrity. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Steve Bannon was supposed to come in uh, just a couple days ago and didn't. And we are already moving to hold him in criminal contempt. Uh, we'll take that vote tomorrow night, uh, assuming it passes out of the committee, which I fully expect. We are quite unanimous uh, in insisting that people uh, abide by their lawful duties. Uh, it'll then be taken up on the House floor, and then it's sent to the Justice Department. Uh, and the statute says that they will have a duty to present it to the grand jury. Now, you're right, uh, the criminal proceedings uh, don't happen overnight, but they happen much more quickly than civil litigation. Uh, it took us two years to compel uh, Don McGahn, the former White House counsel's testimony, uh, in the investigation into the president's obstruction of justice, uh, the last president's obstruction of justice, so civil litigation can take a very long time. Criminal lit litigation can move more quickly. Uh, and I also think that just the deterrent effect, uh, bringing an indictment against someone who is not cooperating, not following the law, will have a powerful effect on other witnesses uh, who will look at that and, and realize they don't want to be the subject of prosecution. So I, I think it will have a very important effect in terms of 
getting the attention of witnesses that are compelled to come in, that they better come in. Congressman, I think there are a lot of people who are watching these investigations. We've seen investigation after investigation. We've seen a couple of impeachment uh, proceedings. And it seems that even in spite of all of these investigations, um, nothing seems to stick as it relates to Donald Trump himself. Some of his associates have gone to jail, but nothing has stuck. What makes you believe that this investigation will be different? Well, I know we are determined on a very bipartisan basis to get the full facts, to follow the evidence wherever it leads and do the comprehensive report uh, that that tragedy requires. So we want to model ourselves after the 9-11 Commission. Uh, we want to develop a set of recommendations to keep the country safe going forward. That's a different process, though, than the criminal justice system. Um, we can make referrals for prosecution when people refuse to show up in Congress or we believe they committed perjury. Um, but uh, whether Donald Trump is held accountable for his acts as president or prior to the presidency is ultimately up to the Justice Department. Uh, and here, I think the Justice Department needs to investigate each and every crime that may have been committed by the former president. Uh, and it may come a, a time down the road, having done that investigation, having worked up a case, that the attorney general needs to make a difficult decision about what is in the public interest to bring against a former president of the United States. But I don't think you can simply ignore these past offenses. Uh, and just to give one illustration, Donald Trump was on the phone with the Secretary of State of Georgia, uh, asking that secretary, demanding that that secretary find 11,780 votes that don't exist. Uh, you know, if an ordinary American did that, they would have been indicted already. Um, and, and I don't think you can ignore that. And I don't think you can simply say, well, the Fulton County District Attorney uh, can look into that. Uh, I think the Justice Department needs to look into that, uh, as well as uh, that indictment in the Southern District of New York against individual one. Um, otherwise, if you take the position that a president can't be investigated or can't be prosecuted rather while they're in office, and then when they leave office, they can't be prosecuted, pr prosecuted either, then you really do have a president who's above the law. Which reminds me of the Protecting Our Democracy Act, of which you are one of the chief sponsors. Can you tell us where we are with that? What's the status? Sure. You know, about, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago, um, as I relate in the book, I, I talked to the speaker about the need to develop our own set of post-Watergate reforms. Uh, in the 1970s, Congress responded to the abuses of the Nixon administration by developing a whole set of reforms, uh, including campaign uh, contribution limits for the first time. Uh, and we need to follow suit. Uh, and so I worked with the fellow, my fellow chairs uh, in the House and we developed this broad package of reforms that would strengthen the independence of the Justice Department, that would protect uh, inspector generals uh, from arbitrary firing and uh, protect whistleblowers, uh, that would stiffen the penalties for the Hatch Act for essentially dragooning the federal workforce into working on your campaign as president. Uh, well, that would provide an enforcement mechanism for the emoluments clause so that a president couldn't again enrich themselves by using their office to rent out hotel rooms to Gulf nations that don't even use the rooms. Uh, and so um, we've introduced that package. It now has, I think, about 130 co-sponsors in the House and the support of about 150 good government organizations from from left to right, spanning the political uh, spectrum. It's our, our hope and expectation that we can take that package up within the next uh, four to six weeks. Uh, and I expect that when we do take it up in the House that we will succeed in passing it. Uh, and then we will need to work on the Senate uh, on those bills, uh, as well as the other uh, fundamental democracy bills, HR1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. How confident are you about getting the votes that you need in the Senate? Well, it's a good question. On the Protecting Our Democracy Act, uh, when I introduced it in the last session, uh, I think while Donald Trump was still the president, Republicans were not willing to um, uh, support even good government reforms they might want to use in a Democratic administration because they feared that Donald Trump would take it as an affront, uh, as an indictment of his conduct in office. Um, this, this session, with him out of office, um, Republicans might start to consider, do we really want Joe Biden to be able to say, I'm just going to ignore congressional subpoenas? 
Uh, do we want the new president to be able to hold a Democratic Party convention on the White House grounds? Uh, do we want uh, top uh, aides to the president to be able to essentially say, as Kellyanne Conway did when she was uh, recommended for firing for her violation of the Hatch Act, well, blah, 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 what are they really going to do about it? Uh, so there's an incentive, I think, now for Republicans to get on board, uh, whether they will or whether they're still living in too much fear uh, of insulting Donald Trump, uh, only time will tell. You mentioned President Biden, and I want to ask you a few things about him. Um, his approval ratings have slipped into the mid 40s recently, and that he's been taking heat even from Democrats about a number of issues, you know, the handling of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the handling of Haitian immigrants at the border, confusing uh, mixed messaging around COVID booster shots, and, and of course the perception that he has not done enough, at least in some quarters, um, as it relates to voter suppression laws. And I'm wondering how concerned you are about the sense of disappointment among even some Democrats in the president and the party and what that could mean for the midterm elections and beyond, especially with Donald Trump potentially waiting in the wings. I think that when we get these two major bills passed, uh, the uh, physical infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better bill uh, that makes investments in Medicare so the seniors can get the vision and eye and dental care they need, that helps parents with child care, that helps uh, uh, young people with early childhood education and later with college education, uh, that provides for paid family uh, and medical leave. Uh, all of these things that are enormously important and necessary and popular, when we get those bills passed, and I'm very confident that we will, uh, bills that, that take uh, important action to deal with the problem of climate change, uh, then I think you'll see the president's numbers rise again. Uh, and even more significantly, these bills are essential to a pro-democracy agenda. At the end of the day, a democracy has to, has to deliver. Uh, and this is something I write about in the book as well, um, I, I think part of the reason why Donald Trump had appeal in 2016 is that he spoke to millions of people that were uh, working as hard as they could. At the point of retirement, they had nothing left over. Their health care uh, was speculative in terms of their coverage. Their, their kids, if they were lucky enough to get a college education, uh, had no jobs and high debt. Uh, and he promised that he would never forget them. But of course, he promptly forgot them. Uh, he made their lot worse, not better. Uh, and those are people that I think we need to win back to the Democratic Party. And when we pass these two bills in combination with the rescue plan that already passed that helped so many small businesses and lifted half the nation's children who are in poverty out of poverty, that will be a really powerful agenda for Democrats to run on. Uh, so I feel very good about what we'll have to take to the voters uh, in the midterms. Uh, and we're just gonna have to get through the next couple of weeks. It may not be pretty about how it gets done, but we're gonna get it done. So part of the problem with that and part of the, the delay has been infighting, if you will, among Democrats, progressives and moderates sort of duking it out about these two bills and which one should be considered first and whether we tie them together or not. That's been part of the delay. And I wonder how concerned you are about just sort of the, the Democrats creating the impression that they maybe can't get out of their own way as they're trying to get these bills passed. Well, first, I would say that uh, Democrats, uh, you know, really across the spectrum have near unanimity uh, on these bills. The problem is that when the Senate is 50-50, you can't use near unanimity. You need unanimity. Uh, and we're, you know, fundamentally uh, equally divided uh, in the House as well. Uh, we have a few more seats than they do, but, uh, but as a practical matter, both houses are as evenly split as they could be. Uh, so. Uh, if, if we needed only 96% uh, agreement, we would probably already be there. Uh, the challenge is in getting those last remaining votes to get us to complete unison. And that's difficult for any party. Uh, but all that being said, I'm very confident we're going to get there. Uh, and we're going to get there because the policy imperative is so great. The country just desperately needs this investment. And the political imperative is equally great. If we're not uh, willing to get these bills done and make the the compromise is necessary to get it done. Uh, we might as well walk over to the other side of the aisle and hand them the keys and say, well, why don't you drive for a while? Uh, we're not interested. Uh, and I am not willing to do that. I know my colleagues in the Democratic Caucus, House and Senate are not willing to do that. 
So uh, it's going to get done. Uh, and the sooner the better from my point of view. Um, Congressman, as all of this is going on, of course, the clock is ticking toward the midterms. Donald Trump is holding rallies now. He continues to claim that the election was stolen and, and looks for all the world uh, like a presidential candidate in 2024. And I, I was reading a recent Pew survey that showed that 60%, 67% of the Republicans and Republican-leaning independents who were surveyed said that they would like to continue to see Trump be a major political figure for years to come. 44% would like to see him run again for president. And that's up 10 points since January 6th. Um, how concerned are you about Trump's continuing appeal to a big portion of the electorate? Well, I, th I think it's a grave concern because if you look at what he did to the country when he had a chance to lead the country, it was an unmitigated disaster that ended in a violent uh, attack on the seat of government. Um, but we need to continue making that case. Uh, during, the, during the first impeachment trial, um, I remember vividly uh, standing up to deliver one of the closing arguments uh, and having one of my staff uh, stop me and, and tell me uh, as I was uh, getting ready to, to end the day that we had persuaded the senators, including the Republican senators, that the president was guilty, uh, but they still needed to be persuaded why he should be removed. Uh, after all, he was putting conservative justices on the court and lowering their taxes. Um, why did he need to be removed? Uh, and you know, the import of that was that we had proven that the president of the United States withheld hundreds of millions of dollars from a nation at war, Ukraine, at war with Russia, in order to get Ukraine's help to cheat in the next election. And that still wasn't enough for the Republicans in the Senate. Uh, it was a bit like uh, a juror in a criminal trial saying to the judge, OK, uh, he's guilty, but can he just go on running the country? Uh, and we warned during that trial that if they allowed him to remain in power, that he would cheat again uh, in new and different and, as it turned out, far worse ways. Uh, and tragically, that's just what happened. Um, you can draw a straight line, I think, from the fact that uh, after Bob Mueller testified, Donald Trump felt he beat the rap for his Russia misconduct, which led the very next day to engaging in new misconduct, this time with Ukraine, because he was back on the phone the very next day with the president of Ukraine, once again, seeking foreign help in his election, and draw a continuing line from that misconduct um, through his impeachment uh, and acquittal to even greater misconduct. And if people think that if he's put back in office, that he will somehow have learned his lesson uh, and won't abuse the power of that office in his personal self-interest, um, they are mistaken. Uh, and that is not a lesson that we can afford to learn again as a country. After all, there are many tens of thousands of people uh, who died from this pandemic, uh, perhaps more, perhaps in the hundreds of thousands, uh, who might have lived, but for the, the, uh, the extreme narcissism and incompetence of that former president. So uh, I, I intend to continue to make the case, um, much as I tried during that trial, that uh, that is a road this country just simply cannot go down. You write extensively in the book about the influence of Donald Trump on um, a number of your colleagues who you call out by name. And it seems that in the aftermath of January 6th, that there was this moment, this brief window where even uh, the former president's most ardent supporters, most vocal supporters, really thought, you know what, it's, it's time to cut ties with him. And then just as quickly, that window seemed to slam shut and it was back to business as usual, support for Trump as usual. What happened there and what does that tell us about his influence? Well, you know, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, in the wake of that terrible uh, insurrection, you could see for a very brief moment, uh, Kevin McCarthy wonder whether he should stick with Donald Trump. Um, now that, that pang of conscience or that finger to the wind, whatever it turned out to be, uh, lasted only about 30 seconds in the case of Kevin McCarthy. But in the case of Mitch McConnell, um, you could see that he recognized what a disaster Donald Trump had been for the country, for his party, 
for the institution uh, of the Congress that McConnell had served in for decades. And you could see him try to grapple with this. Um, indeed, after the second impeachment trial, um, he, he uh, took to the Senate floor to explain that Trump was uh, personally responsible for uh, the inciting uh, that crowd by using the biggest megaphone in the world to broadcast the biggest lies in the world. Uh, even went on uh, at some point to imply that impeachment was too good for him, that there were other remedies, uh, for example, the Justice Department, um, that may be a more appropriate. But it was only two weeks after that, that he was asked, well, if he's the nominee again, will you support him? And his answer was absolutely. And in that two week window, um, we lost the opportunity as a nation to move forward. Uh, and what I, try to, what I try to reveal in the book is how does that happen? Uh, how does someone within a two week period go from blaming someone for a bloody insurrection uh, to saying that they would absolutely support them again if they were dominated. Uh, and, and I do think that uh, what we discovered over the last four years is we knew that courage was contagious. We would also learn that so is cowardice. Uh, and after uh, one after another, with the president punishing anyone who stepped an inch out of line, Republican leadership lost their nerve. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that was so striking to me after the insurrection, I was, I was there on the House floor for the whole thing, uh, there until they were battering the doors and breaking the windows, is those people who were climbing up the building and beating police officers, they believed the big lie. But the people that I served with in the chamber, they knew it was a big lie and they were still pushing it, still pushing it, even when there was literally blood on the ground. Uh, and to me, that's unforgivable. Uh, and, and, and this is what puts our democracy so much at risk. Yes, it may have cost Mitch McConnell his job in the Senate or his job as leader if he came out against Donald Trump. But at the end of the day, why are you there? Why are any of us there if we're not going to do the right thing when the country really needs you? Which leads me to uh, a conversation that you had last week where you called uh, Kevin McCarthy and others insurrectionists in suits and ties uh, for that reason. And made me think about, of course, the midterms coming up. Um, and if things go the way they often do, where the party that's not in power then becomes the party in power, um, it's not unlikely that Kevin McCarthy could become the Speaker of the House. What happens then if that happens? Well, uh, you know, terrible tragedy as a practical matter, I think Donald Trump will be speaker because Kevin McCarthy will not stand up to Donald Trump in any way, shape or form. Uh, I tell a story in the book about Kevin McCarthy, which I thought was very revealing. Uh, it's a story that takes place uh, in 2010 when I was on an airplane flying back to Washington, DC and coincidentally he was seated next to me. And we had one of those conversations you have on a plane uh, while you're waiting for the movie to start, uh, any movie, uh, so you can escape. Uh, and in this case, we were talking about who was going to win the midterms that were still six months away. I said the Democrats were going to win, and he said the Republicans were going to win, and it was a nothing of a conversation. And we get to Washington, we go our separate ways, uh, and apparently he goes off and does a briefing to the press, which I don't find out about until the following morning. Uh, and he tells the press that the Republicans were going to win the midterms and everybody knows it. Uh, he sat next to Adam Schiff on the plane and even Adam Schiff said Republicans were going to win the midterms. And I, I learned about this in the morning and I'm just, I'm in utter disbelief. And I, I make a beeline for him on the House floor the next morning. And I said, Kevin, if we're having a private conversation on the plane, I would have thought it was a private conversation. But if it wasn't, you know, I said the exact opposite of what you told the press. And he says, well, yeah, I know, Adam, but you know how it goes. Um, and I said, Kevin, no, I don't know how it goes. You, you just make stuff up and that's how you operate because that's not how I operate. But that is how he operates. Uh, and someone with that little regard for the truth may be a perfect fit for Donald Trump for an era in which truth isn't truth and you're entitled to your own alternate facts, as Kellyanne Conway put it. Uh, but in my, my point of view, there's nothing more corrosive to a democracy than the idea that there is no truth. Uh, and I don't think that we can afford to let anyone like that near the speaker's office. 
Congressman, a couple of quick things before we go to our audience questions. And, and one is that in spite of all that the country has been through, the impeachments, the investigations, the COVID-19 pandemic, the contested election, the insurrection, um, all of which you document in the book, you have said that you remain optimistic about the prospects for this country in spite of everything. Um, where does that optimism come from? I'm glad you asked that question because I think people are in desperate need of optimism these days. Uh, and I didn't write the book to discourage people, quite to the contrary. I wanted to sound the alarm, but I also wanted to, to acknowledge that we're gonna get through this. And where I found inspiration over these last several years is by looking at truly inspiring people uh, who were courageous enough to stand up. Uh, in the case of our former ambassador, for example, Marie Ivanovich, uh, she was first through the breach, told by the president, by the, the State Department, not to testify. She defied them. Um, she got a lawful subpoena. She came in. She told the truth. Uh, this was a woman who had served in dangerous places around the world, but was hounded out of her job by the president and his acolytes and, and the, the commentators on uh, Fox Prime Time and the president's son, uh, hounded out to the point of danger to her life if she remained in that post. But she was willing to do another great service and come and testify. Uh, and I remember her walking into that hearing room, the kind of hushed respect that fell over the audience uh, and how uh, she sat and stared down the president as he was uh, attacking her in real time during the course of that hearing. And when she got up to leave, the whole room stood up with her and applauded her courage. Uh, seeing her example, um, was inspiring to me, and I hope it's inspired to others. Uh, I remember where I was and the moment I, I heard Mitt Romney announce his verdict in the first trial and talk about how important his faith was to him, that he had children and grandchildren to answer to. And I listened to him and I thought, you know, the founders were right to believe that, that human beings possess sufficient virtue to govern themselves, mm -hmm. that we didn't need to be ruled by a despot. Uh, and I am, I am completely convinced uh, that the, the millions and millions of Americans who cherish our democracy and the proud legacy of that democracy far outnumber those who are trying to tear it down right now. And that's why I know we're going to get through this. So one last thing before we go to the audience, and that is for people who maybe don't work in Washington or not involved in the political process, but are deeply concerned about the future of democracy in this country, what can the average person do to help promote and preserve democracy? Well, we, we have to recognize we can't all be Marie Yovanovitch, uh, but we can all make our own contribution. Uh, we can all show, I think, the kind of leadership she did in our own personal lives, in our civic life, in our corporate life, in our public and private life. Sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one with our neighbor. Sometimes it's volunteering for an organization uh, half, a con you know, half the country away. Um, but each of us can make a difference at the time when the democracy really needs us. And the advice I would give people is don't try to do everything. Uh, that way paralysis lies. Uh, but just decide this is the one thing I'm going to do. If you care passionately about the environment, there are any number of great organizations that you can join online or in your community to help save the planet. Uh, if you're deeply concerned as I am, with these efforts to disenfranchise people of color around the country. Uh, and you're a lawyer, you can donate your legal skills to fight back. And if you're not a lawyer, you can get involved in Stacey Abrams organization mm -hmm. or others like it, uh, that we are going to have to, um, uh, we're gonna have to amplify all around the country. So um, there, are, there is lots to do. Um, don't try to do it all, just decide, this is where I'm gonna make my mark at a time when the country really needs me. Well, with that said, let's go to some questions from our audience. Uh, Pete asks, please discuss the need for a strong domestic terrorism law, which currently does not exist. Uh, this is the issue that I looked into uh, and worked on a bill a couple of years ago in the wake of the uh, terrible shooting outside the Walmart um, and, and the murders at the Tree of Life Synagogue and others. Uh, with the realization that domestic terrorism uh, as the director of the FBI has said is now our paramount, paramount uh, terrorism threat. Uh, now, I have to say, given the terrible, terrible abuses 
that we witnessed in the Attorney General's office uh, during the last four years, and particularly under the leadership of Bill Barr. Um, it, uh, it's a hard sell to give the federal government uh, greater powers in this area. Um, and, uh, and we need to make sure that uh, if there is legislation in this area, that it's very carefully drafted to protect civil liberties uh, and First Amendment rights. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we take the problem of domestic terrorism uh, just as seriously as we took the problem of international terrorism. Uh, and that, that is not just a statutory challenge. Uh, it's, it's a challenge of making sure the resources are devoted to it, that the leadership is devoted to it, uh, and that we face the threat uh, squarely with our eyes wide open. Uh, one of the challenges that I confronted during the Trump years was that the intelligence agencies were badly politicized uh, and reporting about domestic terrorism was discouraged. Uh, and when it was encouraged, uh, it was uh, directed uh, at threats that were lesser threats than those that were greater. Uh, that is, uh, it, it, the, they were, there were disincentives to highlight the threat from white nationalist terror uh, and to hype the threat from groups like Antifa or organizations or thought like Antifa. Um, and when you politicize the intelligence that way, um, you don't tell the country what the preeminent threat is and you don't direct, direct the resources where it should go. Um, it's very difficult through statute to prevent that. Uh, if you have a president of the United States and you have a director of national intelligence, at, as we did in John Ratcliffe, who are willing to push a political agenda that is different from the, the national security and safety of the American people. Question from Rhonda, who says, if Trump does not run in 2024, do you have an opinion on who might be front runners among the Republicans in the presidential election for the nomination? She also says, sincerely hope Trump is not the candidate. Time to move on. And she says, again, thank you for your service. You are a true American hero. Well, uh, thank you for the question and the, the nice words. Uh, honestly, I'm convinced, much as I wish I were not, uh, that Donald Trump will run and that Donald Trump will be their nominee. Uh, and I say that because I think it would be intolerable to Donald Trump to see anyone else in the limelight. Uh, for Donald Trump to watch Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis or Mike Pence become the nominee and get all that attention would just drive him out of his mind. Uh, so I, I think just pathologically, he's not capable of not running. Uh, and given the fever grip uh, uh, in the Republican Party and his iron grip on that party, um, I think that he becomes their nominee. Uh, so uh, I think that's what we have to anticipate. If it weren't him, uh, as between the other Republicans, it's very di difficult to say because at the moment, the Republican Party is not a party of I ideas. It's, a, it's an autocratic cult around the former president. So were it to deviate from that uh, and become a party of ideas again, which ideas those would be uh, are very difficult for me to forecast. I will say this, um, working on the January 6th select committee with, with people like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, I hope that they represent the future of the Republican party. Uh, we need the, the GOP to be a party of ideas again. They're very conservative. Their ideas are not the same as mine, but I respect the fact that they're not willing to lie about the election, uh, like the, the nominal leader of their party. Uh, I think that takes a lot of guts. Um, and, and so I think we need to prepare though uh, for another run by Donald Trump. Frederick asks, if Democrats get more of their folks in the House and Senate, what are the chances for real gun reform? I think they're very good. Um, and. I, I'm convinced that uh, on the gun issue, we are very close to a tipping point. Uh, and you know, the, things, the thing about tipping points is uh, when you get there, it happens very quick. But before you get there, it's very difficult to tell exactly when you're going to get to the point where all of a sudden you can pass meaningful gun safety legislation. But one of the things that, that I noticed in the last midterm elections uh, three years ago, uh, was, was something I had not seen before, and I've been in Congress for 20 years. And that is in competitive congressional districts, far from running away from the gun issue, Democrats were running towards it. Uh, they wanted to campaign on it. They recognized that the issue was an important one to their constituents, and they were on the right side of it. 
that is a very different situation uh, than it used to be. Um, and we do need to increase our numbers. Of course, the, the biggest impediment uh, to progress remains a filibuster in the Senate. Uh, but if we can expand the ranks of uh, Democratic senators, we can do away with the filibuster altogether. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly favor with doing away with it uh, at the moment. That doesn't seem feasible. Um, but we, we absolutely need to carve out voting rights as an exception to the filibuster. But to get something done uh, like gun safety, we're either going to need that carve out to be one that encompasses all constitutional issues, uh, or we're going to need to just get rid of the filibuster. You mentioned uh, voting issues, and there's a question from Nancy who says, I'm so concerned about voter suppression in the 2022 and 24 elections. Is Congress able to act and pass legislation before we lose the majority in either house? Well, th this to me is a, a tougher lift than the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better bill. Um, because here, uh, it really comes down to Joe Manchin. Uh, and, and to some degree, Kristen Sinema, Kirsten Sinema, but, but I think Joe Manchin is really the key. Um, now, I, I got a sense of Joe Manchin during the impeachment trial. Uh, and while I can't claim to know him well, my sense from him was that if we could demonstrate to his satisfaction that Donald Trump was guilty and his continued presence in office posed a danger, he would vote to convict him. If he could explain it to his, his constituents, he would vote to convict. Well, we made out the case sufficiently, and he did vote to convict. Uh, and that was a very difficult and courageous vote. Uh, after all, I think Trump probably won his victory in West Virginia um, in 2016 was far greater than his victory in, for, you know, for example, Utah. Um, so compared to, to that, to asking Joe Manchin to vote to convict a president who probably won by 30 points, Compared to that, um, persuading Joe Manchin to carve out of the filibuster voting rights should be by comparison a much easier case to make. Hmm. Question from uh, AK who <coughs> says, your book is a gripping story well told. I found your background fascinating and fell in love with your father. Is there a silent majority of Republican leadership that actually supports a more moderate perspective in line with moderate Dems? Well, first of all, thank you for the kind words about my dad, uh, who is 93, lives in Boca Raton, where every week is basically like a Seinfeld episode. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, is there a silent majority? There isn't a silent majority among Republicans. Uh, sadly, um, I think um, the strong majority of Republicans still embrace Donald Trump. <clears throat> and uh, and yet, I, I, I think certainly the solid majority of Americans reject what he stands for. Um, the challenge is that a majority of Americans is not always enough to elect a president. Uh, sometimes you can elect a president, oftentimes, with a minority vote. Um, and one of the things that I write about in the book is um, some very big structural problems in our democracy uh, that are quite separate and apart from all the damage that Donald Trump did. The first is, as long as we have a gerrymander, then a minority of Americans will control the House. Uh, not always, but for a substantial portion of time, uh, particularly in the early parts of a new census and, and reapportionment, uh, a minority of Americans will control the House because they can gerrymander those districts. Mm -hmm. This is why I feel such urgency about getting H.R. 1 passed, which would prohibit the gerrymander. But there's also an anti-democratic uh, structure in the Senate, where 23% of, um, of the people uh, control 60% of the votes in the Senate because of the heavy weighting of rural states in the Senate. So the Senate is already an anti-majoritarian institution. If you layer on top of that the filibuster, you have one uh, minority institution uh, with another minority protection on top of it. And then finally, given the antiquated electoral college system, um, you often have a president who does not earn the support of a majority of Americans. And there we need to finish getting enough states on board for a multi-state compact that would effectively do away uh, with the electoral college. Those reforms, I think, are, are essential 
uh, in the mid and long term uh, uh, for the health of the country. Because you simply cannot have a minority of Americans uh, running the country uh, and expect our democracy to persist. Uh, finally, the most minority based institution now of them all is the Supreme Court. Uh, and, uh, and there, uh, given the way uh, Mitch McConnell, I think, very cynically stacked that court, um, I find myself in favor of expanding the court, something I would have never contemplated before, um, so that we can unstack the court um, uh, from the, the gamesmanship uh, that Mitch McConnell played uh, to the detriment of that institution and the country. So that leads me very nicely to Nancy's question, which is what are the chances of adding more seats to the Supreme Court? I, you know, honestly, I think uh, it's very difficult. Um, first, we're, we're going to need to persuade the president uh, that that's necessary. Um, and the president, I think, is very much an institutionalist uh, and expanding or changing the size of the court probably cuts against the grain. Um, but, but I think the reality is the Senate is not the same Senate that he once served in. Um, and given the way that that Senate has been manipulated to prevent Democratic presidents from seating justices and to allow Republican ones to jam justices on the court, uh, you can't ignore that, that recent past. Um, but, uh, but in addition to uh, the need to win over the president, and I don't know what his position is, but so I'm just speculating here. Um, we're also going to need to uh, to sufficiently overcome any problem with the filibuster in the Senate. Uh, so um, I, I, I think the near term prospects uh, without the addition of more uh, sen senators, Democratic senators uh, are difficult. If we do expand the Senate ranks and do away with the filibuster uh, in the next session, uh, then that opens up new possibilities. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to something that you spoke about earlier from Brian, who says, a wise person recently suggested that citizens should focus on a threatened institution of our democracy in order to help protect it. If one were to focus on Congress, which concrete steps might one take as a citizen to protect it? Well, you know, the most powerful thing that people can do uh, in terms of affecting the Congress is, is to get, uh, get out and vote uh, and to encourage others to vote. Um, one of the other reasons why I'm, I'm optimistic about the future is um, you know, those who believe that the country should move in a progressive direction, those who believe that climate uh, change is real and are desperately concerned about what's happening to our planet, those who, who are devoted to our democracy and our institutions all of those folks vastly outnumber um, those in the other party or those of the contrary views. Uh, it's part of the reason why Mitch McConnell and Republicans in the House and Senate are so fixated on suppressing the vote uh, and particularly suppressing the vote of people of color is that they understand that their ideas are backward and unpopular and they're never gonna win on their ideas. Their only hope of winning is if they can discourage enough Americans from voting at all. Um, which ought to tell us what our job needs to be, which is to encourage and make sure that Americans vote. Um, if we voted with our numbers, in fact, if young people voted in their numbers, this country would move swiftly in a progressive direction. Uh, so we know what we need to do. And as we're trying to get HR1 passed and trying to get the voting rights legislation passed, we need to use uh, both strategies right now, a legislative strategy but a grassroots organizational strategy as well. Uh, the, the Stacey Abrams effort needs to be expanded to in every single state in the union. Uh, and every single one of us can be involved in that undertaking. Uh, so I, I think uh, in terms of trying to save our, our institutions, the most important institution of all is the institution of our elections. Uh, if people don't believe that we can rely on free and fair elections to, to settle our differences and to choose who will govern us, where does that lead except to violence? Uh, so um, I, I would put that first and foremost as the duty of every citizen, uh, not just their own vote, but encouraging others to vote. There probably isn't a single person on this Zoom that doesn't have a family member or close friend who didn't vote in the last election and didn't vote in the one before that. Uh, and not necessarily because they were hostile to the idea of voting, but they just didn't think it was important enough 
to take out even that small part of that day to go and vote. Uh, and it falls on all of us to make that case why that's got to change. Question from Rich, who says, in regard to the January 6th commission and Steve Bannon, why is the commission not pursuing its power to invoke its inherent power of contempt and have the sergeant at arms arrest Mr. Bannon? He says such action is legal and can be performed while the case is being turned over to the DOJ. Uh, you know, we are uh, considering other remedies uh, like inherent contempt. But all of these remedies have their, their limitations and their drawbacks. Um, for one thing, we don't have a jail in Congress anymore. Uh, we did 100 years ago. So we don't have someone that we could lock up uh, recalcitrant witnesses. Um, but even if we did, and we went out and arrested someone who was uh, thwarting congressional process, uh, they would likely file a habeas corpus petition and we would be litigating that habeas corpus petition uh, in court. Uh, and that may very well take place without that person being in custody. Uh, so there are limitations on that too. We've explored, for example, the idea of inherent contempt if we, if we can't lock someone up to impose a daily fine until they comply. Uh, and I like that idea. But even then, uh, apart from those whose salary is paid by Congress, um, to garnish someone's wages uh, would require us to go to court and enforce that civil action. Uh, so there is no real uh, shortcut here but probably the most effect, uh, effectacious uh, and the fastest uh, and the strongest uh, and, uh, and I think the most likely to deter other lawbreakers is prosecution. Uh, and that's why we're proceeding so quickly on that path, but we are not excluding any other remedy. And we may revive the remedy of inherent contempt. We may be forced to litigate in civil court, um, but we are determined to do whatever is necessary to make sure that uh, the American people get this information and we can protect the country. Two quick questions before we say goodbye. Uh, this one comes from Anne who says, because of the intense amount of day-to-day -day preparation required, did you sleep at all during the impeachment <laughs> trial? Uh, I did sleep, but not that much. Um, and it wasn't a problem of not being able to sleep. It was a problem of not having enough time on task Although I will say that I made a terrible mistake just before the trial. Um, I had a loose filling and I thought I should get that taken care of so it doesn't fall out during the trial. Um, and I went to get that cavity refilled and uh, apparently it aggravated a nerve. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately I was in terrible pain during the trial. Um, I needed a root canal after that. Um, and I got a root canal during the trial. And I want to tell you, no one, no one was ever more pleased to get a root canal than I was. Um, but I did during that period uh, have to, well, didn't have to, but I would wake up uh, every couple hours uh, with the need to take more Advil. Uh, so um, Hakeem Jeffries, one of my wonderful colleagues uh, and fellow house managers, during that trial uh, did pet, pet me up and prop me up by saying, you know, Adam, this is like the championship game and you're playing injured, you're playing injured. And, uh, and it did help me, it did help me visualize the, uh, the, the task. Well, we'll end on this question that I think inquiring minds want to know. It comes from Maureen who says, you would make an excellent president. Would you ever consider running? Well, uh, thank you. I. Uh, I'm flattered by the question. Um, you know, my, my dad that, uh, that we were talking about earlier gave me some very good advice uh, when I was a kid. Uh, he said, if you're good at what you do, there will always be a demand for you, which was a really liberating idea because then I just had to focus on trying to be good at what I was doing. Um, and that's what I've tried to do. Uh, you'll be, you could be the judge of whether I've succeeded or not, but I wanna continue trying to, to do the best job I can in Congress. And, and let the future take care of itself. Um, much as you might like to plan and strategize and think about the future, it's such a fortuitous line of work that I'm in, it's very difficult. Uh, so I'm just gonna try to focus on doing a good job and, uh, and let the future take care of itself. 
Well, we will have to leave it at that, but I will tell you, Congressman, that the words American hero have popped up a number of times in the Q&A feed here. So there is great appreciation from our audience for the work that you have done. I have to tell you, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to have this time to speak with you. Uh, and we certainly wish you the best in all your endeavors in Congress as you continue this fight to preserve democracy and to get done everything that get, needs to get done to move the country forward. Also, congratulations on the success of the book. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Thank you for moderating today. And, and I just wanna shout out to the people of, of Philadelphia. Um, my favorite meme uh, from uh, the, the, the last election was one which I can't, can't describe fully because it involved an expletive, but uh, <laughs> it showed uh, the, the, uh, the Capitol uh, and it said, uh, Philadelphia, saying expletive to despots in 1776. So thank you, Philadelphia, and wonderful to join you. That sounds just like Philly. Thank you so much, Congressman. <laughs> Thanks to all of our audience for joining us today. We hope that you found this conversation to be insightful and informative. And thanks to the folks at the Free Library, to Andy and Jason and Laura for bringing all of us together. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.